I can't go solve everybody's problems. It's access and responsibility. So the people that I'm giving access to my heart, they have to be responsible with it. Yeah. But I would try to flip it to everybody right now. It's like, if I want access to your heart, I gotta be responsible with the parts of your heart that you give me. Hey, it's Rich, and you're listening to the Mature Me Podcast, weekly content devoted to all things life, leadership, culture, and faith. Thank you for taking some time to tune in. Make sure you subscribe and follow us on all our social channels so you don't miss a thing. Let's listen to today's episode. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Mature Me podcast. My name is Rich Wilkerson Jr. and I am coming to you today from the Design District here in Miami, Florida. It is a beautiful day. In fact, I'm feeling the sun like you never have felt it before. It's quite magical. It's quite beautiful. It's letting me know that there is a creator and I can sense his touch. That's a great intro. Amen. We're so happy that you're here today, wherever you're at in the world, man. Thank you for tuning in. If you're right there on YouTube, do us a favor, like this, subscribe to this channel, share this content, leave us a comment. In fact, I'd love to know right now where you're tuning in from, where you listen to this at. Maybe you're listening by way of Spotify in your car. We love all of our audio listeners as well. Very grateful for you. One of the things I want to remind you of is every Tuesday morning, I release a Leadership with Rich email free of charge. Thousands of people are getting that every Tuesday morning, fresh, hot off the press. I think 6 a.m. that thing goes out. We want you to get that. So go to richwilkersonjr.com. Very easy to sign up for it. And we'll make sure that hits your inbox. Here on Mature Me, we're not just talking about growing old. We're talking about growing up. And I am joined by uh, one of my favorite people in the world. He's no stranger to the podcast. Dakota Duran is not in the house, is on the roof. We're on the patio. We're on the we're on the uh, we're on the rooftop, on brother. the balcony, on the roof. Excited to be outside for the Mature Me podcast. Feeling do you like good being today. out here filming or how do you feel about it? How do you I feel like with the it. sun? I like being out in the sun in general. You know, years ago, you did a, a, a collection of talks entitled Seven Hacks to Happiness. It was in a collection of talks and are you OK? Check it out. How do you remember that? And uh, one of the hacks to happiness. Tell me was taking three walks a week. What a small hack to happiness. This These are all research and, and data that you're bringing. And uh, so for me, it, during the work week, at some point, I'm, I'm gonna take a five minute walk around. So this is great, this you, is my outside time. You know what's funny is that like, I actually love messages that will take the Bible, theology, but then I love also some messages that take those truths and then really apply them to your everyday life. You know yep. what I'm saying? Like, if you're going to walk in happiness and joy, yes, you need to know Jesus, but there's probably some practices and habits that you can apply that will make all the difference in the world. And I just grew up in church and so many times, like all the stuff re regarding like your physical body, none of that was ever taught to me. Yeah. Like going to the gym. I never heard a message on eating right. healthy, even right. though we know that like being a glutton is like one of the <laughs> deadly sins. I don't know why there was never a message. I never heard one message on gluttony. Yeah, I think that... Um I think as the world has gone more and more, we obviously have more even data on that research psychology. And I think that, uh, I think that as the world's gotten better, I think the church has finally caught on. And I think there's obviously leading Christian voices in that now, which is cool, but I agree. I, I love when the two collide and whenever you get the practical, I love like seeing research on just smiling, laughing, and then seeing verses in this, in the Bible, like laughter do with good and like a medicine. It's just like, Scripture has this stuff, and I think if we can continue to be intentional, we can connect the dots. I think I'm a curious person. Today, I went and uh, I, watch this. This will be controversial, but um, for years I went to a chiropractor. In fact, you and I back in 2016 had uh, an accident on a golf cart that I flipped <laughs> I love a golf that cart. This was such a significant moment. It's Brother, shocking. It was a life changing moment. Out of tragedy yep. came beauty. Yep. I flipped a golf cart. We've talked about it before messed my neck up that led me to chiropractor and that led me to the gym but i moved a couple of years ago from the house that i was living in and so my chiropractor is way too far on the beach and so for the last two or three years i haven't really been going to the chiropractor today i went to the chiropractor and i love going to these guys because when you get in there they all like on the first session they're all cool and like chill but it's really like them teaching you like all of their beliefs right and this guy today he started talking about 
kinesiology. Is that the right word? Yeah. I guess the study of muscles. But even that's a very like, the connotation of that word and its impact changes from guy to guy. My man, this guy today had me holding my arm up and what he was teaching me was from some, maybe Dr. Goodart. I don't, I don't know these people. And I'm sure in the comments, there's gonna be someone who's like, how dare you? That's, you know, that's witchcraft. I don't know. But today he was having me hold my arm up and then he was touching different parts of my body that allegedly have weakness or ailment or have problems in the future. And any place that he touched that had a problem, my arm would go down. Wow. And I can't tell if this man was doing a magic trick on right. me pressure points. or if this pressure point stuff is real all that to say i get curious and i started asking him questions and so i spent about an hour in his office this morning wow. asking him all about his life 25 years his practice right next to our church and uh invite him to church we'll see if he comes let's go just turn it into evangelism let's go what do you think about that though like the pressure point i i think that you experienced it today. How can it not be real? I don't think he's doing anything weird. I think he understands the body. I, I love just the idea in every area of our life trying to operate at our highest function yep. and believing that whenever you get better in one area, you're going to get better in every area. And I think that like you're saying in the church, I think for a long time, we only focus on one area, which is what we consider to be spiritual. Whenever we open the door, I think what, what our church is on the journey of is understanding that everything's included in this, yeah. how we steward our body. It's actually very spiritual, how we do relationships, actually very spiritual. So yeah, I think, I think that's fantastic. I think one of our favorite studies that we ever did together uh, a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe just a year ago, a year and a half ago, we read uh, Willard's work. Was it Renovation of the Heart? Yes. And um, guys like John Ortberg, guys like um, John Mark Comer have really all drafted, I think, from a lot of Willard's premise around the soul. Correct. And I think even all that, that's wonderful language. We start talking about your soul and how it's multi-layered, um, really starting with the heart yep. being your will, uh, from the heart goes to the mind, yes. which is your thoughts, your thinking into your body, right? Correct. Yes, body. Which would be your appetites, um, your habits, and that last ring even being your relationships, which Correct. I want to talk a little bit about that today, and how all of these things sort of overlap to create this invisible you, the real you. Um, I like that quote. Uh, I am a soul, I have a body, you know, yeah. like I am a soul, I have a body, but all of these things are impacting the shape of my soul. What is the shape of your soul? And um, as we start to pay attention to these other things, my thought life, my heart being surrendered over to Jesus, of course, but my body and how I steward it, this temple, and even the relationships, it's all forming and shaping uh, the real version of who I am. Yeah, one of the things that I loved whenever we started reading that book and we did a collection as a church as well in this is the idea is like whenever you start the journey of spiritual formation and soul formation, understand you might for the first time be intentional on this journey, but you are not just starting this journey. Mm. <laughs> that that's a word was huge for me, understanding like, hey, this might be the first time that mm. I'm having a conversation on what is the formation of my soul. However, know this, your soul has already been formed. Already Whether has a shape. Intentionally started that journey or not, it started. I think that's powerful because I think that many times we're just living by default, not by design. And I think as we grow and as we mature, and a lot of what we're talking about always here on this channel and in our podcast is not just one category of life, but really trying to talk about all the different categories of life. What's it like to be a 30 year old man? What's it like to yeah. be a 40 year old man? And it's not just Bible knowledge that's going to get me there. It's actually applying the Bible knowledge. Yes. And the Bible knowledge doesn't just go to my head. It goes to these other areas that makes me me. Yep. And what is me is not just my brain or my mind, but it includes my body. And it includes, here we go, full circle, three walks. Is it a day or a week? Uh, a, a week. week. <laughs> a week. Not a day. Do three prayer walks a day, though. There you go. Do you ever do prayer walks? <sighs> I'm not a big prayer walk guy. I like to pray in a chair at my house, like if I'm gonna have an intentional time of prayer. I love prayer That's not walks. the only place I pray to be clear, but if I'm like, you know. I love a good prayer walk. Yeah. I like walking, I like jogging, 
a lot of times when I'm being creative, I'll get kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. And the quickest way for me to get unstuck is to get up from that place and go do a lap. Yeah. I call it a Jericho march, but yeah. I don't want to be too spiritual with it. No, yeah. but just to go do a walk. And so I actually love prayer walks and I actually believe firmly in the research that's done by psychologists and scientists, but just in my own experience, bro, get out in the sun, get out of your desk or your normal environment, yep. change that place up and you're going to get a, you're going to get a new perspective quick. Yeah. Today, as you mentioned, like would love to dive into friendships. Yes. Brotherhood the importance of relationships. I'm not talking about romantic relationships. I'm talking about people in your life. And uh, I came across an interesting graph the other day. Uh, Don Cherie actually showed it to me. And it's a graph of how you spend your time each decade of your life okay. and with who you're spending the time. And it's so intriguing because uh, as you go through, the older you get, the more time you spend alone. The older you get, the less time that you spend with friends. In fact, at around 21, 22, your time with friends peaks, which is so interesting. Mm. Makes sense to a degree as you're starting a family, as you're going to do things professionally. Your time with coworkers starts almost to replace your time with friends at that point. Uh, But for us, as you're saying, we're starting this journey of mature me, you turning 40, myself turning 30. It seems like the older we get, the harder it will get to be in real relationship. Mm. Have you experienced that already? What, what's your thought hearing that? Is that like, of course? Well, I like the question and I like the topic today, especially even as we're talking about like Willard's like definition of the soul. Cause I never ever considered there's that old quote, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Yep. But that always felt very external to me. Didn't it feel very, internal in the makeup of my spirit yes the makeup of my soul but willard will go on to describe you know not just your family of origin but your family of choice the people you put around you is shaping you yes not just your physical external outcomes but your the real you your thought patterns and who you become i think it's aw tozer who talks about seven rules of self-discovery and one of those is like who you spend time with yes so they're all saying the same thing yeah you were telling me about this chart and i think it's really interesting i think even today as we sort of talk through it, I think we're talking through it through our own lens, which are two uh, men, 30 and 40. And I think that even creates a different layer because I think all the research, you were just telling me some stuff before we got on here just about how loneliness is increasing in men, how men are having a hard time making friends. And I think it's probably safe to say that maturity Uh, as you continue to grow and become who God's called you to become, that you would create a value point to be intentional. Not that you'd be the friend of the world, but that you'd make sure that you have the right friends in your life and that you'd make time and value it and make it a pursuit and a priority. Yeah, I think one thing that I resonated with that you just said is the idea of like, you you think just friends are just an addition to your life. Mm. And something that talking with people, reading this book that we talked about from Dallas and Willard, it's very, very clear that friends don't just shape some experiences that you might have in life. Friends are shaping your soul. Yeah. Friends are not just, uh, you know, around you. Friends are shaping you, are forming you. And so I, I think uh, what's interesting about the research that I was telling you is specifically in men. I feel like women, uh, maybe they have more of a natural proclivity to uh, be open with each other and be open to new relationships and new seasons. I think for us, it's harder to open up, which creates a more difficult time with us creating relationships. And what research would tell us is that only 15% of men would believe they have six or more close friends. Wow. 15% of men would say that they have no close friends. 15% of men. So I think when it comes to, like you're saying, through our lens, um, I think it's something to be aware of on the journey of maturity is not only are we gonna have to fight for friends from the start, but I think the older we get, the more intentional the more thoughtful, the more time we're going to have to put into making sure, do I actually have real men in my life that I know and that know me? I came across an article. I think I heard Manushka teach about it. I wish I knew what journal or what periodical it came from. I believe it was the Wall Street Journal. 
but the title I've seen it kind of circulate. It's called the friendship recession and post COVID it's a lot of what you're talking about right now, which is especially in men that there is this recession towards friendship mm. and loneliness on the incline, if you will. And the author actually speaks about the damages of loneliness, that loneliness is uh, equated. I don't know where he comes up with this, but it's equated to smoking 18 cigarettes a day. That's the type of impact that it's actually having on you, on your mental health, on your physical health, that it's actually wow. damaging you when you live in loneliness. And for me, uh, I'm always looking for the connection back to the Bible. Yep. And you go back to the Garden of Eden as God is creating things and he says, yes. it is good, it is yes. good. Looks at man and says, it's very good. Yet the first problem in the Bible is not a sin problem. Mm -hmm. The first problem in the Bible is man's level of solitude. I'm using solitude because it's a great alliteration. The better word is man's loneliness. Yes. I think solitude is an intentional stepping away to be with God or to take time away to work on the inner self. Whereas yep. loneliness is a default place that of going, I, I wish I could change the situation, but I don't know. I think loneliness is maybe birthed out of isolation at times. But when you look at Adam, God says, it's not good for man to be alone. So everything's, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he gets to Adam, he's like, yo, this is not good. Mm -hmm. This is not good that you are in this state. So what does he do? He creates a helper. He creates Eve, creates Eve from the side of Adam. I love that preaching point that he didn't no doubt. form her from the feet because yeah. woman's not beneath the man. doesn't right. take him from the head because he's not a, above the man, but from his side. In fact, from the rib. And I think there's so much there for marriages that we could talk about another time because it's just powerful, powerful teaching. And it's all right there in the scripture that, you know, woman's taken out of man. And then in marriage, man goes back into woman. They become a new creation. They yep. become one flesh. That's powerful. That's miraculous to me. But let's just start start right there that God says it's not good for man to be alone. This is before the fall of man. Correct. This is before depravity is set in. Yep. Loneliness is the first problem in Eden. If it was a problem in paradise, how much greater is the problem in a fallen world there that we go. live in? And so I think it's something that we have to talk about. I think it's something that we have to have to get revelation about because if we're going to be mm -hmm. honest with you, according to that chart that Don Cherie's showing you, and I believe all of it, it's that as life gets going, we get busier, um, more and more things take our time. And I think what that chart is just showing you is simply that as my life grows and increases, sometimes I stop valuing or I stop making time intentionally or unintentionally to continue to form friendships and continue to invite people on into my life and into the journey. Yeah. I find it interesting when you start talking about loneliness. I, I think that what you just shared about what Manushka shared about, about the 18 cigarettes per day, this is not like just like a feeling. <laughs> this is not like, oh, I'm just having a bad day. I'm lonely. And that's the only way it's affecting. It's affecting your health. It's affecting your mental health thing that's important to understand about loneliness it's one of the leading contributors to depression mm. and so we start trying to just talk about depression well what is causing the depression i think a lack of relationships can be one of those things is yeah. what research is telling us it's not just my opinion it's not your opinion it's not just some scripture that we take from the bible this is also research that's reaffirming what we know that whenever you have a lack of relationship, it can put you in a mental state that you are not excited about life, that it's hard for you to get out of bed, that you don't see the purpose of going out to work that day, that you don't see the reason to get around a group of people. Why? Because people are just people, but you don't have a real connection with them. Mm. So loneliness is not being around people. That's not that that's not the fix all here no loneliness is not just putting yourself in the right position i think that's a part of it but it's also opening up your heart it's not just a foot posture it's not just a placement in the room it's your heart posture it's opening up your heart and i think for me just personally this is something that as you get older that it's not that you don't want to it's just fatigue <laughs> It's just like, man, I feel like I just tried to open up my heart to someone two years ago. Now they've moved to a different place. Now they're in a, a different city. Yep. How many people can I open up to? And we start to give up because we're, we don't, 
we see more of our fatigue than we see the need. Wow. And I want to encourage myself and I want to encourage someone out there that we have to continue to fight for relationships. And the, the key word is fight because this is not always going to happen naturally. This is an opportunity that we have to force ourselves to step in with our natural position, but also our heart position. And you preached a message around this idea of the relationship formula. Mm. And it talked a little bit about proximity and maybe talk a little bit about that because it's not just about having friends. I think it's about having the right friends. Yeah, yeah, that's, I mean. How does, you know, like. Well, I think that, I think that's what you're getting at. Like, number one, loneliness rarely has to do with I'd say it this way, you can be lonely and be all around people. Yeah. Because loneliness really doesn't have to do with what's around you, it has to do with what's going on inside of you. Yep. And a big part of what happens inside of us is that you can have people in your life, but you got the wrong people in your there life. There you go. And so you just nailed it. It's like, I think the thing that brings the joy, the thing that brings the fulfillment is the right relationships. There you go. And so I think it begins with us understanding the damaging effects of loneliness. Yes. I think, especially to men listening right now, like, I think we should get into that. Like, I would love to get that from your yeah. perspective, from my perspective, like, why are men closed off? Why are men having a hard time making friends? Why are 15% of men without any close friends? Correct. Wow, we gotta speak up about this. But I think a as you understand, okay, I got a revelation from it, now what? Well, maybe you got a bunch of people around you, but they are not leading you in the right direction. Correct. Uh, I love this idea like you are the average of the five yeah. people you spend the most time with in your life. And like just think about that in every category of your life, whether that has to do with your spiritual Fitness. maturity, whether yeah. it has to do with your emotional maturity, yeah. your finances, yep. your dreams. Like so who are the people that you're spending the most time with? Because you are the average of all of those people. Bro, if you're the smartest person in your group, you need a new group. There you go. You have to keep reaching up. You have to keep growing. You have to keep leaning into people. I think you're speaking about some things like of going like, maybe it's fatigue. I think a lot of people just got hurt. There you go. Been betrayed, been yeah. let down, been disappointed, gave my heart to someone. They took it, stomped on it. I'm not talking about rom romantic relationships. This Correct. happens with boys. No doubt. This happens with dudes. Like, bro, I thought we were growing together. I thought we were trying to become something. I think for me in my life, you know, you start with somebody and I thought we were on the same mission. I thought we had the same dreams. I thought, I thought we had the same values. It's like, oh, get to 40. You look around, there's bodies left and right. People that went that way, people went, that they deviated from the path. Not that I got the path all the way right, but it's like, I thought we were on this path. And it's like, nah, I detoured. And sometimes people are detoured and you're like, I don't have any energy to go down that way. That's gonna be dangerous for me with what I feel called to do and what I feel like the Lord's spoken to me. So I, I think you gotta get the right relationship inside of you. Maybe we'll take a moment. I, I do want to get to some of that, but like with guys, why would you, when you hear these stats, yeah, why do you think guys are not making friends? Like, why do you think guys are, do you think guys want to be lonely? Do they lack the tools? Maybe it's a combination of all these things. What are just some thoughts for you? Because I really want this to help someone as we, I, I want to get to some, truths that I feel like we've got principles, yeah. but I want to make sure that we're kind of landing on the problem enough as I hear that stuff. I'm like, do I believe that? Have I experienced that? Do I see that? I think, I think for me, the answer is yes. And I'll, I'll weigh in on that, but w what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. I think part of me goes, when are we around friends the most in this graph? It's in our teenage years and our early twenties. And I think in those stages, you have extreme shared experience and proximity. You're in school. Yep. You're in clubs. You're, it's that On time teams. of your life. What, what does the TV show Friends say? It's a time of your life where your friends are your family. Bro, you love oh, friends. Oh, man. You and your wife. Woo. My goodness. I, I mean, it's true, though. You should though. get paid for promoting Friends. That, Do you know how many please, Friends episodes I'll I've seen? I'll take it. I'll take it right now. Do you right know now. how many entire Friends episodes I've seen? How many? I'll be honest I've with you, my first year of marriage, a... we we watched all 10 seasons. You love that stuff, yeah. man. Yeah, well. It's pagan. I think, it's pagan. I think outside. It's debaucherous. Yeah, it is. It's sinful. What was the body count you said? I don't know, a lot though, bro. Yeah. There's a Reddit thread about how many people, what are eight seasons, how, many, how much sex they had with different people. It's like, brah. Yeah. I love it. It calms my spirit. No, it's damaging your Soft spirit. Soft power. Man. Sorry. It's changing a narrative. Yeah, but anyways, okay, keep going. so going back. Go back to friends. Two friends. But what is the what is the theme? What, what what's the truth from friends? 
if they can have any truth. The reason that they created the show is to show a show that said the time in your life where your friends are your family. Yeah. And regardless of any truth that friends actually showed, that's true. Like, don't you think? Yes, I do. In your early 20s, in your mid 20s, for the most part, especially here in the city of Miami, a lot of single people in that age group, yep. not around their family, maybe move into the city. This is a time in your life where your friends are your family. It's shared experience. And I think whenever you start to get in different seasons and leave that shared experience, what I've seen is it exposes what you were bonding over. Mm. And I think for men, it's a word. It exposes that sometimes we're bonding over very shallow things. All we're talking about is the experience that we just had together. All we're talking about is the person that we just interacted with. Mm. All we're talking about is what we're going to do next, what we did last night, recounting experiences, uh, excited to create a new experience. But it's, it's not around ideas. It's not around value systems. It's not around who we're becoming. A lot of times, mm. and I'm not saying this for everybody. This is just observations yeah. from some of the friendships that I created in these times. I'm going to say a big word, but it's just shallow things that we're bonding over. You start stepping into marriage. You start stepping into having kids. You start stepping into the workplace. I think that sometimes we, we don't even know how to articulate what we believe about those things. I think right now, uh, in terms of families and being a husband, I think that whenever I'm talking to uh, guys who are not in the church or just kind of a little bit in the church, like the idea of having a mission for your family, mm. what's the purpose for your family, what's the goal of your family, what does your family stand on? No, it's more about what our family does, what we're a part of, mm. what are the schools that we're going to. But when you start doing that, I think it's it's just a lack of a real connection. And I think what creates relationship, strong relationship, is vulnerability. And I think for me as a man, this is a challenge, 1,000%. What are you actually going through? It doesn't have to be big, but what are the thoughts that you're having right now? What are, what are you trying to accomplish right now that you just, quite frankly, are not accomplishing? What are the actual dreams in your heart? Mm. Can you share those without being insecure, without being afraid that your friend's going to laugh and go, bro, what are you talking about? Mm. So I think for me... Whenever I look at that time period and spending time with friends and then the epidemic of loneliness in men, I think that as Christ followers, we should have an example and we should have an up on anybody else. Because our soul and our faith is the deepest thing in this world. And that should enable us to create a connection that other people quite frankly, can't make. And so being able to open up with your faith, being able to open up with your struggles, I think is is difficult for men. And then I also think sometimes it's, what are we actually bonding yeah. over? I'm thinking about right now, um, C.S. Lewis has a beautiful teaching on the four Greek words for love, yes. which is always just like a powerful teaching because we use love for so many things. You know, mm -hmm. I love my wife and I love pizza. Well, like, right what you right. know i do really love pizza <laughs> yeah. but i really love don Cherie more than pizza and when you study the greek language it's like they knew that and so they had other words for love because there's different types of love and they have the greek word eros which is like the erotic romantic love a lot of songs today are about that and a lot of right. people that's what they're infatuated they're looking for an eros love um there's a storge love which is probably what you and I share in so many different ways, which is a family love yeah. that like, bro, I love them. They're my family. I was born into this thing. They got my blood. It's, it's that funny thing where it's like, you know, Dakota can talk about any of his brothers and be upset with them. And these guys are an idiot. But if somebody else right. tries to say they're an idiot, what'd you say, bro? You know, I'm like, act like I'm a throw. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, they don't. Whether I am or not. Yeah, yeah, that's another you. thing. Um, the powerful thing about, the Bible is over and over again when it comes to God's love is the word agape, yeah, which is that an unconditional love, which is so powerful. You know, that God is agape. It's not based on circumstance or conditions. It's just the essence of who he is. I love you in spite of you. 
But the love that we're talking about today is what they called phileo love. And it really is about a love regarding a mission, there you about go. where we're headed. There you go. Yep. And I think that you just nailed it. I think that probably what's lacking for a lot of men based upon our society and the way that it's going, and I'm not a sociologist and I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a cultural anthropologist for goodness sakes, but I do live in Miami. I do have 40 years now under my belt of just being around guys. And I think a lot of the love is a friendship love and it's based upon high school, around teams, around sports, um, around clubs. And I think it can at times be shallow. Uh, I don't know if the intent is that, but it Correct. can maybe just land there where it never gets deeper than just the thing that we're doing. And I think that this is the power of leadership. Yes. I really think that men need leadership. I think that we need voices and people that go before us as forerunners that blaze trails that say, Hey, it's okay huh, to talk about this. Yeah. Hey, we're gonna talk about this yeah. and take us deeper. I think you get out of that high school world or out of college, out of the fraternity, and there's no more systems or structure that's formulating or creating friendship. And so if you don't go to a church, correct. Um, if you don't join the cycling club, if you don't go to a gym, before you know it, you find yourself living all in digital communities. You find yourself living all online, watching screens, and human connection begins to dissipate right before your eyes. And before yeah. you know it, you just find yourself lonely, not by design, but by default. And the longer you go staying closed up, the more and more comfortable you become. Mm -hmm. That's a powerful thing, right? Like dysfunction. I remember my dad, when yes. I turned 16, he took a 1993 Ford Explorer. It was red, I think, when we first got it, but it turned orange in the sunlight. Had it all souped up and put a system in it, you know, the 12-inch subwoofers. You got to get that. And he gave it to me. And it was like, oh, this is awesome. But, bro, after six months of driving this, I think he had 300,000 miles on it. Around, like, six months into it, the AC went out. And uh, I live in Miami, bro. Like, of course. You can't have a car without air no, conditioning here. That is a... That's what we should do at Vuhai. We should just take kids. You want to, you definitely want to go to heaven. You know, like, <laughs> exactly. You want to suffer for Christ? Yeah, yeah. Take a ride around. Like, Remember what? those like hell houses or like oh, heaven's dude. gates, hell's flames? All we do is put people in a Ford Explorer, put the windows up, drive around. And it's like, you don't want to go to someplace hot. That's, that's silly. It's stupid. But point is, is that I used to just get in the car and roll the window down. Yep. It's fascinating how quick you can adjust to a car that doesn't have air conditioning yeah. by rolling the windows down. But it's funny because people get in that car, they're like, bro, it's hot. I'm like, I'll roll your window down. They're like, that's not good enough. Yep. The car was meant to function optimally with an air conditioning system. Yeah. But something went wrong. I didn't get it fixed. I didn't address it. And I got comfortable with dysfunction. Yep. Roll the window down. And I think when it comes to relationships for a lot of men and for people out there watching, is that we get accustomed to being lonely. We get accustomed to doing life in isolation. We get accustomed to being with people, but never sharing our heart. We get accustomed to being with people and going through the motions. Like it's, it's, it's a two way thing, right? Correct. It's not just me unwilling to share my heart. Correct. It's me never you got it. trying to get access to your heart. Yeah. And we live snorkeling rather than going beneath the surface to find out where the real gold is, where the real treasure is. And I think that men in particular, they need leadership for that. I think the teams, the fraternities, they created uh, maybe at times a false sense of that or, or even an aspect of that. Yeah. And phileo love is a love that's not just based upon solely doing something. It's about heading in a direction. That's yep. what mission is about. Mission is about direction. Yep. Speed is one thing. Direction is so much more important. Where are we headed together? Yep. And of course, if we share in the truth of the gospel, how much easier should it be? That's the whole don't, un, don't be unequally yoked. That's not just about like, yes, it is light and darkness, but it's trying to get even deeper. Like when we get into friendship, correct. What is your mission, bro? Yes. Like what's my mission? I, I think we talk about our staff at like Vu church. It's like, dude, I'm not just here to play church. I'm here to make an impact. I'm yeah. here to make a difference. I'm here to advance the kingdom of God. If you're going to be on this staff, you're going to have to share in that mission. Totally. You don't have to do it forever, but we ain't got no space and no room for somebody who just wants to take up space and go in a different direction. Yes. We can't, we can't plow the field. We can't get the work done if we're not all headed in the same direction. I was watching um, The Breakfast Club the other day and Candace Owens was on. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, she said something, I don't know where she got it from. They're talking about marriage and this is kind of detouring, but I think it might spark a conversation. And they were given a hard time because she's a black woman who married a white man. And at times she gets criticized for that. And she said that something that she had read, and I kind of resonated with me. She says, I think more often that people are attracted to IQ, not just physicality, not just mm -hmm. what they look like on the outside, that most people marry based upon IQ. And to me, that sounds a lot like don't be unequally yoked. Like, yeah, you could be unequally yoked by just by marrying based upon someone's physical appearance, let alone their thinking, their capacity, who they are. I think I'm always drawn to IQ. No like, doubt. are we on the same level thinking wise? Or do we care about the same stuff? And even my friendships, it's like, yeah, if you're so, not headed in the same direction as me, yep, bro, this feels like a wrong relationship. This yep. feels like you're not going to get me, or I'm not going to help get you toward towards a shared outcome towards a shared mission. 100%. Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. Ooh. And I love the idea that you're talking about IQ and getting around people that call you higher. You're the average of the five people that you're around. It's like whenever you go to someone else's house, you've been in your house. This whole idea for men, I think is so important to not get comfortable in discomfort. Not get, not being okay with the angst, not being okay with the loneliness. Yes, we might go through seasons of that, but we cannot set up our tent there. We have to continue to move forward and push ourselves through the next season. You go to somebody else's house after being in your house and you're like, dang, I do need to put the pictures on the wall. You, Dang, mm. I, they're taking care of their stuff like this. Man, I could, I could go back to my house. You start seeing your house in a whole different way. It's the same thing for your soul for your heart, for your life. You start getting around other people, they create a reference point for you of inspiration yep. to grow. And I think too many of us, including myself, depend too much on our own thoughts. Wow. That's we try, hey, we're gonna go get better. All right, let me just get a whiteboard, sit by myself for five minutes. No, 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 that's not the first step. The first step in a research paper is what? Doing research. <laughs> you want to create a new creation. You got to look at what's already been created. You got to go talk to somebody. You got to get a it's, reference. It's, it's a reference and it's the same thing uh, for people. But I love the idea too of just not just going to somebody else's house and seeing, letting them into yours. And I love what you're saying. It's a two-way street. Friendship is a two-way street. And some of us uh, as men are not happy with the depth of our relationships. Maybe you actually do have the right people in your life, but maybe you're not getting as much fruit from the relationship as you would like to. I just want to encourage somebody that you can set the tone. In mm. friendships, I think sometimes we just, oh, let's see where it goes. I, I think what I've been encouraged at times with my siblings and it's like, if I want more, I, I got to ask more. I got to I got to go there first. Talk about the idea of of leaders fight first. One of the most my favorite thing about David and Goliath and that whole idea of him beating Goliath is not just the fact that David had the best one on one fight ever. Winning that battle incredible. He shouldn't have done that. But the best part to me is that after David won, it activated an army. The Israelite army very good. They were described as afraid and deeply shaken. And then one man, David, decides he's going to go fight Goliath because there's an army. If you're a king, it's like the last two words you want your army described as Jeez. afraid and deeply shaken. But one shepherd boy goes out and fights his battle. What happens immediately when he defeats Goliath? said the Israelite army gave a great shout mm. and then began to chase the Philistine army. Mm. They couldn't take one step. If you look at the two places, the Valley of Ella and the Gates of Ekron that it mentions that they ran to, that's 25 miles apart. From an army, you couldn't take one step. Now they're going 25 miles. Some of us have friends that were like, man, they're not going to take a step. No, 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 no. They'll go the distance with you, but you got to fight first. Yeah. You got to step out first. And I think for me, uh, one of the most helpful tools that someone told me is just ask questions. Yep. And if they don't ask them back, answer your own question. Mm. Ask to get into their heart and open up your heart and watch us receive more fruit and battle this idea of I'm alone in this life. I think the most dangerous person in the world 
is a lazy, isolated man. Mm. That's a dangerous, dangerous person. Lazy. You were created to work. If you don't have a mission or a vision, I think the whole American dream about retire at 65, I think that's a death wish. I'm not saying you got to have the same job and work right. for the same employer. And that's not at all what I mean. I just, but I don't believe in retirement. Yeah. My, my dad right now who's going through cancer, it's like he's in 72, but he's redreaming. He's had to shift what he was doing for most of his life. And now as he's going to finish this um, procedure that he's been going through, hopefully in June, he comes out of quarantine. But man, he, he's taking this time right now to, to dream yeah. and, to, and to storyboard his life and to write out new goals because he understands, even at 72, I need new dreams. Yep. I need new visions. I need new work. But then this other part of isolation that when you're isolated, when you're trying to solve all your problems, when you're trying to uh, psychoanalyze yourself, when you're trying to counsel yourself, woo, it's dangerous, bro. Yeah. It is really, really dangerous because you come up with all sorts of craziness and wild thoughts. Um, I think living in our own mind, that's a scary place because all of your thoughts that come to you, you didn't originate. Mm -hmm. uh, the enemy... It's his favorite place. It's his playground is your mind, an empty mind. Yeah. That's why when it comes to Judeo-Christian practices of meditation, we're not emptying our mind. We're filling our mind with yeah. his truth. And so friendship is everything. I think we should take a little bit of time kind of getting practical with this, you know, because you're saying something here that I think is fantastic about going first. Because maybe someone's watching right now and they're like, bro, I'd like more friends or I'd like better friends or I don't have any friends or we're so quick to blame, totally. which by the way is the garden. You know, right. the serpent made me do it. The woman made me do it. It's the blame game. And yeah. the blame game doesn't solve anything. The blame game doesn't get you anywhere. The blame game just leaves you That's heartbroken it. and leaves you stuck in that same spot. So uh, I don't think that you can just point fingers and blame people. I think that you actually have to take responsibility and initiative. And I think from what you're saying about going first, I would say if you want a friend, you got to be a friend. There it is. What you sow is what you reap. That's in all categories of life. I just believe in sowing and reaping. So if I want friends, I got to first be a friend. And when it comes to friendship, come on, when it comes to any relation, let's just go there. There's two key words you want to think about. That's access and responsibility. Very good. So that which I give access to, you must be responsible with it. Meaning for me, I had to learn a long time ago that like so pastoring a church today, we've got, we just had Easter with 13,000 people show up. What in the world? Well, that's 13,000 problems. Right. This week alone, the texts that have come through my, my, my phone on pastoral care. Yep. Parents dying, car accidents. We can go through a list of issues. All of those things move me. All of those things I have a pastoral heart for that I'm praying as a pastor, I want to create systems that there are people that can look after all of those needs because I can't look after all those. I have a certain capacity and my capacity is not limitless. Totally. It's limited. So I'm going to have to understand that not everybody's emergency becomes my urgency. There it is. I have to define how much I can take on. Let me tell you whose emergency is my urgency. Don Cherie, mm -hmm. Wyatt, Wilde in Waylon, yep. my family, Dakota, D, my brothers, my mom, my dad. But there are layers and levels to relationship. I have a staff that we look after. I love these people. These people are on the mission with me. Yep. Um, there's key servant leaders. I just think there's layers to it. I can't go solve everybody's problems. It's access and responsibility. So the people that I'm giving access to my heart, they have to be responsible with it. Yeah. But I would try to flip it to everybody right now. It's like, if I want access to your heart, I got to be responsible with the parts of your heart that you give me. <laughs> I think that Very too often good. we're like, I'm not, they, we blame Dakota's not good with my heart. He doesn't take, well, what am I doing towards his? Have I asked him about his dreams? Yeah. Do I know what's going on with your family? Do I know the stress points in your life? Yep. Before I can expect you to be a friend to me, am I a friend to you? So good. So I think it's just two great l words about going, all right, access and responsibility. If I want someone, if I want access to someone's life, am I responsible with the areas of their life they've given me? And before I give people access into my life, they need to show me that they're responsible with 
parts of my life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Of course. And I think oftentimes uh, the biggest trap in this is whenever we don't have people in our lives, we, we just accept anybody to share our hearts with. <laughs> and Ooh, as, talk we're, about it. as we're fighting for vulnerability as men, we also, we're not oversharing. I, I, you've talked about, we're, we're going to share, like, especially to people that we were just acquaintances with, that they don't have responsibility. We're going to share scars, not, not open wounds, we're not trying to bleed on people. We're not trying to process with people just to be heard. Uh, we we got to process with the right people. Well, that's a key principle in preaching, right? Yes. Because how many times have we gone and it's like, bro, I think that you are Processing. so many preachers will use the pulpit. There you go. I don't want to, I'm trying to work on all this. Yeah. Some preachers in right. some pulpits will use that place as a place to vent or to bleed. And I'm, by the way, I've done that before, yeah. but that is not a mature man or woman of God. Yeah. That I teach from a scar, something that's healed. And now I have a story that I've learned as opposed to bleeding on people with an open wound. That is not what they're there for. Yeah. That's not shepherding. Yeah. It's not their responsibility to deal with your personal problem or your personal wound. You need to get healed yep. before you begin teaching on that. Yeah, and, and I think that that's the people that we're leading. I think that's the people that are acquaintances. I do think that they're, I don't think in my own life, I would not be able to get through certain seasons if I wasn't able to share open wounds with people. Of course, yeah. And so there's a distinction. We're not talking about not sharing at all. We're not talking about fixing the problem before you share it with your best friend. No, we're saying we're not gonna share it with everybody. We're gonna share it with someone. Not everybody has to know what you're going through. Somebody has to yep. know what you're going through. I remember me and Blair, uh, brand new married. I, I think one thing that I do wanna highlight is whenever you have to be the most intentional about having community is in transitions. Getting a girlfriend, getting engaged, getting married, having kids, new job, new city. These are all times that maybe you've done a really good job of being in community, but these are times where feelings can start to emerge in your heart when thoughts can start coming to your mind and these are opportunities that you don't have to walk through alone sometimes we choose to walk through alone in our own detriment and i think one of the loneliest times to a degree of my life with friends was my first year of marriage mm. and it was because i was still in college it was our last year in college got ma married really young some really awesome things about that and some difficult things about that one of the difficult things about that is nobody in college is married <laughs> nobody right you know in fact like who's married like yeah, us yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody, nobody. <laughs> so trying to talk about like especially yeah, in yeah. your younger immature days when you talk about the one thing that you're really bonding over for the most part is experiences nobody had that shared experience mm. with me you're right Genuinely. And that can be very damaging because you start mimicking single guy behavior or mimicking single girl behavior. That doesn't work in married behavior. Does not work at all. And also either mimicking that or just not having anyone to process. talk to. Yeah, process with. And so I think for me, I think family and, and my really close friends that may not even been living in the city, but for us, um, we're like six, seven months into our marriage and we knew we had gotten married young it's not like we we're like no this is not like no we're young How old i'm are you 21 guys again? and she's 20. wow and so we're thinking hey we're, we're trying to do some life together we're going to get through college and we ended up moving to miami immediately after we didn't even know yet though and in march um blair got pregnant and that was something that not only were we not expecting, but like babies are always a blessing, but it was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Talk about like Maturing. being young, talk about like, hey, we're just gonna take this year slow to, here comes an eternal soul in your care, son. It's like, oh God, help us. 
And so I remember oh, just like the roller coaster of emotions of. What did you do when she told you? You were just like, this is amazing. Like you just did that, or I, you're like, I, are you? I just remember being in shock. Like we definitely were excited, and the worst part was. The and shout part. out to all the ladies out there that wait to tell your husband, your spouse that you're pregnant. I don't know how you keep that in because that's crazy. Like to be a, like your closest person in the world, you're like going to wait a few weeks. Well, you know, some people did? do that, you know, but Blair couldn't do it at that point. The heck no. I was getting home and I was about to leave straight for work. This is like the worst timing ever, but she's not going to hold this in. What was your job? Course. Working at a golf shop, baby. <laughs> Shout out Lakeland. Send so us nine I, irons. I was about to, yeah, That's exactly. So weird. We start asking. Them. I was about to go to work. I get home, and she tells me that she's pregnant, and we hug and we embrace. We can't believe it. We're scared, but trying to be excited. I remember getting in the car and calling my oldest brother, Denny Rodney, and him answering the phone and barely being able to like speak crying just sobbing i it was one of the it was one of the like times i just remember I, i'm not like unemotional there's times where but i could not control it like weeping what was the emotion scared F fear genuine fear um when you don't know yet what you're going to do with your life and then you have a responsibility like that and you haven't ch even chosen like a full career path yet and just yeah it was scary to be clear at that point so i get there i find out i get in the car like five minutes later the worst timing ever and looking back on it it wasn't the conversation that me and my brother denny rodney had that helped me it was just somebody the fact that I would have cried regardless, but crying alone and crying with someone who's on the other line going, Hey, I don't know what's happening, but I love you, brother. I love you. I'm here. I love you, man. How can I help? I'm so sorry. Talk to me. That, that made all the difference mm. for me. And in that moment, I'm talking about my brother, but what he was in that time, it's a, it's a relationship. It's a friend. It's someone that you can be vulnerable with. And um, I just say all that to say those moments of transition are when doubt can creep in and when you can choose to. Yep. I, I don't have anybody I can relate to. That's a lie. There's somebody that can speak to you. Yep. There's somebody that can help you. And I think for us, uh, even if it's just that moment of just being open, it, it was a game changer for me. My grandpa used to always say the quality of your life depends on the quality of your relationships. Mm. And I think it's true. Um, I don't, I don't consider myself a wealthy or rich man financially, Yeah. but I do consider myself a rich man relationally that I've got people in my life that I think know the real me, people in my life that cover me, you will always be as sick as your secrets. Yes. And the whole world doesn't have to know all of your problems, but someone needs to know your problem. And I just believe that wholeheartedly, you know, that we need to get the right people in our life, people that can hear us and talk to us. And I believe it this way, that good friends, they make the mountaintop so much better. Yeah. And good friends, make the valley not nearly as bad as it has to be. Yep. And that's sort of what you experience, I think, with your brother is that you found out this news, which is actually great news. Great news. But at 21 years of age with no job, working at a golf shop, right. newlywed, <laughs> don't have a single friend who's actually married like yep. you to also add onto that uh, life <laughs> and life more abundantly in your wife's womb. That's scary as all get out. And so yeah. when you're scared, what do you go to? Some people go to the bottle. A lot of guys go to pills. A lot of guys go to the strip club. A lot of guys go to, I'm getting out of this. How many guys in that moment right there, they run? Not because they're bad, not because they're evil, but because maybe they don't have a place to go to. They don't have a shoulder to cry on. I can't tell you how many times I just, I have to cry in private to get up and be strong in public. There you go. 
you know, like, I think if the only time you display faith is in these public moments, well, then you're, you're going to be doomed. It's the same thing with our emotions. You know, where do I find the stamina or the strength to get up and, and to lead? It's because in private, yes. in secret, there are other men that cover me and stand with me. And I think that we should take a, a little bit of time just being like practical because I think you and I were just chatting before we even got on here. It's like, man, I want to make sure that like we're helpful because I think this is a real crisis. This is a real big part of stunting people's maturity that man, as your life goes on, it seems that relationships begin to disappear and disintegrate yet all the way back in the Bible. God's like, you need someone, you need some people around you. You yep. need community. The whole church, by the way, is all about community. It's not about a program. It's about a people following Jesus together. All of the scriptures, are meant to be digested in community. Yes. I know we all love our Jesus calling. We all love our daily devotional. And I'm for that, by the way. We write that kind of stuff. But man, understand if you're reading the Bible, uh, you're really not reading the Bible appropriately, effectively, or how it was written when you're only reading it individually. Yep. The majority of the New Testament was written to churches, body of believers. But practically speaking, if you're going to get friends, you got to be a friend. Yep. If you're going to get access, you need to bear responsibility. There you go. What stops people, I think, practically speaking, from forming deeper friendships is this word vulnerability. And uh, it's a buzzword, but it's an important word that I think men struggle with vulnerability. They don't, from my experience... When there's a leader around, and this is what leadership is, is what there you're saying you about go. going first. This is very good. It's like, I, I, I want to be the type of man that I'm not waiting for others around me to get vulnerable. I just want to be vulnerable. Now I have to do that in safe places, but I have learned that if I want access to your heart, I got to show you some of mine. There's that old, um, it's, it's a negative expression, but it, it it matters when it comes to the condition, you know, you sh I'll show you uh, mine. If you show me yours, that's negative. But with our soul, it works that way. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you want access to someone's soul, you got to show them some yeah. of your soul. And I think leaders that are listening right now, when it comes to a church or a community, like if you want people to open up and go deep, you have to open up and you have to go deep. You have to be real. You yeah. have to be authentic. Vulnerability is that interesting thing because vulnerability, here's what it is. It's burying yourself. It's going back to the garden, naked and no shame. It's like, all right, I'm going to strip myself naked in front of you, yeah. emotionally, mentally, spiritually. I'm, I'm, I'm putting a weapon into your hand and I'm believing and hoping that you will not use that weapon against me. So good. But what does that require? It requires trust. And when there's trust in relationship, when there's respect and when there's yeah. authenticity, oh my goodness, the joy and the benefit is like nothing nothing compares to it. Yep. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. And that's where I would try to, try to encourage men today is like, not everyone, but find some people that you can get vulnerable with. One of the easiest places if you have found yourself getting comfortable in dysfunction is like, go get a therapist. Go get a counselor today. Like yeah. Start there. Start learning some of the tools there. Like yeah. find a safe place to begin to bleed and begin to process and then bring it into your friendship. I think that we live in a world today that's like full of like therapy and I'm not against, I'm for counseling, I'm for yeah, therapy. Yeah. But I think many times, <laughs> the reason why we have so many therapists and so many counselors today is because there's such a lack of just good friendship. Wow. Just to, it, well, Bro, if we could just get back to good phileo friendship and good brotherhood there you go. and good families, yeah. we wouldn't need this amount of, of, of counseling. If we just had fathers, you know, yeah. many teachers, few fathers, if fathers would show up, if, if families would be restored, bro, we wouldn't need to spend that much money in therapy. But Today, if you're in a condition where you don't have anyone, yo, in the same way you go to the gym and you pay for it, I, I would go and talk to a counselor quickly. Yeah. I think another uh, word that we can use for vulnerability, because I think sometimes like for guys, it's like, feels like it feels feminine. It feels and it feels like it's always sharing tough sorrow. I think yeah. another word that we when can I was use, 12, right, my it's dad, like deepest it, this or deepest that. And you're not always going through something. Sometimes life is very good. Yep. I think another wow, that's that's a word. Yeah, and it's like being able to share that and be able to talk about what you're excited about. And I think it's just bearing your heart. I'm not talking about just sharing the bad news. I'm, I'm sharing about what's happening in your life. And another word that we can substitute for vulnerability if we wanted to is real. 
just being real. What's happening? And um, in January, we had our first pastor's assembly. And I've been to a bunch of different um, church leader conferences, and I'm grateful for every single one of them because their aim is to equip the church. Yeah. And I love the different churches that are doing this and putting this on. I think it's so helpful. Uh, but one of the things that's supposed to happen at these church conferences is not just information, it's relationship. Yeah. <laughs> And one of the things that we're, we're doing the pastor's assembly for the first time, you want it to feel good. You want people to feel at home. Uh, and one of the things that I was so happy about that it felt was people had their guard down. Yep. That conference was not, or that pastor's assembly was not just specific stuff. It was more just a few general sessions value-based encouragement, but people left so refreshed. And I don't think it was just because of the sermon. I don't I think agree. it was just because of the talks. I don't think it was just because of the worship. I think the reason that we were filled up is because people were real. Yep. Conversations were real. It wasn't how many of you guys got, how, what's going on there? Oh, this is the new thing. All those things are really fun, but it was also just like, Hey, this is what's going Here's the good. And here's what we're working through. And I think whenever you're real, I think it actually gives you an opportunity to be filled up. Very good. I think when you put on, yep. if it was two days of everybody like putting on their best fake smile and yep. best this and only sharing the great news, you leave and you know how you feel? Drained. And I think some of us are going into our friend circles and we're, we're going like, man, I, isn't that group supposed to like fill me up? But I feel like depleted, depleted after it's because you're not being your real self. And it takes an effort to put on. And I think if we can help each other mm. for you, I've learned so much about friendships. Tell me about like identifying someone that you want to be a friend, creating a connection. How fast do you be real with someone? Yeah. What's the trust there? I think there's an old like kind of preacher cliche, but it still is true. Those cliches are still true that there's three people that you need in your life when it comes to relationships. Every man needs a Paul in their life. Someone who's pouring into you, mentoring you. You don't have to know them personally, but it'd be great if you did, but just yeah. someone who's investing into you. It's like you and I are family. We have storge love. We have phileo love. We're on a mission. I feel like a lot of our life is mission oriented. Yep. We have the best time in the world. We're very real with each other, but I'm probably not at this point going to go to you about my marriage problems. Right. You're 10 years younger than me. You're on our team. Yep. That wouldn't be appropriate. doesn't mean that I don't respect your marriage. It's going, you're not Paul in my life. Of course. The second person you need in your life is, is a Barnabas. Barnabas, by definition, his name means the encourager. We're studying the book of Acts right now. I just saw it. Like he is the encourager. This is just a peer to peer friend, like a colleague, like, I got some guys, my friend, Chad Veach. It's like, we don't compete. I can call him back, bro. We did this on Easter Sunday. He did that. Like it's vulnerable with our win. Then it's like, bro, this is the worst Monday of my life. I think I'm quitting the ministry. I'm not a good preacher. I'm the worst leader. And uh, I don't know how God is ever going to use me again. Like it's peer to peer. It's just like in the yeah. thing with you. Yeah. But then we all need a Timothy. Someone that you're pouring yourself into. And I think that that threefold picture is important. Someone pouring into you, someone you're walking alongside, and then someone you're pouring yourself into. When you get that going, all of that motivates you in different ways. You and I have talked a lot of times, for me in leadership, I have learned that one of the things that keeps me accountable more than my dad checking on me or even my friend checking on me are the people beneath me. There you go. Now you might find in your life, like even for your accountability, like I do better with like a coach on me. Like if I have that supervision person like, not riding me or not pushing me, then I'm, I don't do as good. I get motivated by all three, but my greatest motivator are the people beneath me that I want to be my best for them. Like it's just, for my, having kids, woo, that changed yeah, me, bro. No you know doubt. what I mean? Like, wow, me that too. changed me as a man. Yep. Like, uh, I don't think there was anything in my life sinful or wrong, but there's some things I'm like, that's loose. I want to get disciplined yep. there, you know? So I think that's that's an important part. But when it comes to like, your life, I think that your life maturing is the fact that you're changing, you're growing. Bad company corrupts good character. Character is the real you. But your character is, I think at times, I know people take offense to this, but I think it can be changing. Like you can be going from good to bad, bad to good. Um, 
I pray daily, Lord, keep me. Yeah. I just turned 40. I don't think my temptation, uh, I don't think my lust thoughts are easier today. I think it's like, I just have to, I have to be, I have to realize I'm in a battle. I'm in a war. Yeah. Like, I think that we, we, we fool ourselves if we think we're going to get to an age or to a place that we can't fall back into corrupt character. Yes. So I want to put the right people around me. And at 40, I look around and it's like, I want to always be reaching up. I want to always have some people in my life that have gone some of the journey with me. Yeah. And then I want to have some people that I'm, I'm continuing to pour myself into. And I'm always looking at those three Dude. things. I think practically speaking for people out there that are like, all right, how do you make a friend? Yeah, there you go. I love this. <laughs> I think that's really good because I read a book uh, some years ago. I believe it's called The Like Switch by like an FBI or a CIA uh, undercover agent who would like turn people or he would get in and, you know, become friends with the bad guys and then bring them over to the good side as an informant. It's just crazy stuff. But he had this formula. I believe he called it the friendship formula, but there's four key categories. If I can, I'm going to try to say them out loud, yep. but I think it's good things to think about just when it comes to you making friends, being a friend, uh, which is proximity plus frequency uh, plus intensity. And there's another one. Duration. Plus duration. Yeah. So those are four key great words. Proximity. A lot of times you're just friends with people because they're around you. You know, like you go to yeah. school every day. That guy's in my class. Never would have been friends with him. But for the next 11 weeks, we sit right next to each other in geometry. Yes. You know what I mean? So th that creates something. Some of you, you work somewhere. And it's like every day I see this person. Frequency. Same thing. It's like, oh, every day I rub shoulders with this person. Yep. But then intensity and duration. Intensity is, you know, how, how intense is that time together? Like if you get a friend and you go climb Everest, you might have met him that day. But if you get to the top of Everest and make it back alive, yes, that's someone you're never, ever going to forget, yep. right? That's yep. an intense moment. And then duration, which is how long or the quality or the length that we're going to spend over one time. And so when I think about those four words, these words all having different metrics and these words working together to create a friend, sometimes I've got some friends in my life right now that I'm no longer in proximity with. My best friend in the world is a guy I went to high school with. And I call him best friend because he's a brother to me at this point. Like, uh, he doesn't work in the church. He doesn't uh, share the same mission to that same degree as me. He has a totally different life. But like, bro, we've done a lot of life together. I feel like he's crossed over to brotherhood to me. And I love him. Well, when we get together, it's got to be intense. And there's got to be duration. Because we're missing proximity and frequency. Very good. So I just think when it comes to like forming a friend or building a friend, it's looking at all that criteria. It's going, what's my proximity like? What's my duration like? What's my intensity like? And what's the frequency like? And if intensity and duration are down, well, then proximity or frequency are going to have to be up. You know, yep. work friends, you're going to form some friends just from the frequency. Proximity, your neighbor. I have a neighbor that has a pickleball court. Well, he lives next door to me. Right. We can go multiple days without talking with intensity or duration, but he's my neighbor and I love that pickleball court. Yep. And there's a proximity thing that he's going to stay in my life. Yep. So paying attention to those signs. And if there's someone you want to be in your life, how can you increase one of those signs? I think there's some people on our team that's like, you know, I got to be in Miami. There's something about what God's doing at VU Church that I want to be a part of it. And I know if I lose proximity, there it is. I'm going to lose some of the benefits of what it means to be a part of this community. Those are great things to discuss and to consider when it comes to the relationships in our life. Yeah. Turning 30, I, I don't, I'm not like a, some of you out there, you're watching, you're like, you throw the best birthday parties ever for yourself, which is amazing. I have like kind of tried to do better at changing my narrative of like, that's not selfish. I think it's awesome to create a gathering of people that you love in your life. And turning 30 wasn't like a time that I was like, you know what? I can ask some things of people for yep. this. I can use this as an excuse to get people that I love in a space. And so what that did is I made a decision. I'm going to have this party. And then what that does is, well, who's going to come? <laughs> yep. And immediately I'm going Am I just, am I just inviting people that I happen to be around or I also have an opportunity to go, 
I want to invite people that I want to be around. Very good. That I want to keep in my life. And, uh, you, you know, in our culture here at VU, and I would encourage you to take it on wherever you are, one of the things that I think creates beautiful bonds of friendship for us here, even men, men and whatever, is this thing called an honor circle. When it's someone's birthday or when they get a promotion yeah, at work good. or they have a work anniversary or your kid does something great, what's awesome is going around in a circle and verbalizing and articulating what that person means to you, what you love about them, how they've encouraged you. And they were nice enough to say some words about me. But at my party, I wanted to make sure that I said some things about some of the people that came to my party. I just wanted to acknowledge and say, you know what? I appreciate you being here. I understand we haven't hung around a ton the past few years. However, I want you to know I'm committed to you. And I think that that is the tough part of friendship is what you just said is seasons change and you grow. However, not all of your friends will grow with you. Mm. <laughs> and I think we're talking a lot about your five friends, you're the average of them and they help form your soul. And so immediately uh, there's some good in that and there's some goals that are presented of people in your life that you want to bring in. But there might be some transition in friendship as well. How do you how do you balance that? How have you seen other people balance that? Do you keep everybody in your life? You, you don't ever have, like do you have to tell someone by like, what does that look like for you? Well, I think the back to that idea of like boundaries is really, really important. And um, there are I have brothers. I have three brothers that are my brothers. And then I have a host of Duran brothers as well on, on Don Shree's side. That stuff to me is like family of origin. Like I want to honor my family and uh, these people are in my life. And then there's this thing called family of choice, which I think is equally as powerful and as important. And I think at this point in my life at 40 years of age, I want to be respectful and kind. Uh, I believe in forgiveness. Matthew 18 is powerful, powerful on the power of forgiveness. I want to be a person that doesn't harbor offense, bitterness. But I think as you grow in friendship, you realize that the greatest commodity that you have in life is your time. Yeah. And I want to make sure that I'm spending my time with people who are committed to maturing, there you committed go. to becoming, committed yep. to growing. And I'm curious, going back to that, it's like, I want to learn and, um, I'm not content. I don't have, I said this way, I don't have to be the best day, but I have to get better today. Yeah. And so I think that's a very, very easy value for me. Am I spending my time with people that are committed to getting better? What I have learned in life, not just to men, but towards people, is that a lot of people talk about wanting to get better. A lot of people talk about wanting to be a part of something great, but very few want to actually pay the price of it. I've seen that in church. Everybody I ever met wants to be a part of a life-giving church until they get up until they become a part of life giving church like whoa this takes work this takes right. effort you better believe it yep just like keeping this old body of mine at 40 in shape which by the way i'm not in shape right now <laughs> but just takes work and so for me to fulfill and do the things that god's called me to do no doubt about it it has required pruning by the way i'm sure that someone's had to prune me from their life so let's just yeah of i'm course. not the hero yeah um Great language. Here's great language. You're not bad, but you're not good for me. I think that's really, really great language. Whether it has to be verbalized or articulated. Sometimes people just, we drift, you know? Right. Um, back to proximity and frequency. What you find out quickly is like, oh, we were friends based upon frequency. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were there for a season of my life. Uh, I didn't share everything with you. I also am really grateful for the people that have helped form me and shape me. I, I don't have a lot of like bitterness or hatred towards people. There have been some people in my life that have let me down, that have disappointed me, that I had to recognize when that took place, that they betrayed trust. I had to decide, am I going to be closed off, wounded and isolate, or am I going to keep giving my heart away, believing that this is still God's vehicle for my wholeness, mm. for my fulfillment, for me to fulfill my purpose, that I need people? Or am I gonna go, nope, someone hurt me, that means all people are gonna hurt me. I don't wanna live that way. I think bitterness is a scary, scary thing. But there have been some people on my journey that have disappointed me, that I've had to either verbally articulate it or just articulate it on the inside that, hey, I love you, but I do not trust you. Yep. And that type of language, 
I think is so, so helpful because uh, I've just grown in my life that I, I don't want to demonize people. I think we're all fallen people. I've got issues. I've got problems, but there's just some things in my life I'm allergic to, bro. You know, like you're not bad, but I'm allergic to you. I'm allergic to manipulation. I'm allergic to you yeah. making me a means to your end. Yep. Uh, I'm allergic to you aligning yourself with me for your own personal gain. Uh, so recognizing what you're allergic to, it's like, this is not good for either one of us. This is making me dysfunctional. This is allowing me to begin to tolerate things that I don't believe in. And so, Correct. yeah, there's been people, I think pruning is a part of God's, for our life as a garden, you know, for things to bloom and for us to flourish, things have to get, if you don't prune something, you can't produce something. So for fruit to come about, things have to be pruned. I think relationships are one of those things. I can already hear some dude going, that's why I got to get divorced. No, you have selective hearing. That's not right, what I'm saying. Right, right, right. Um, but I think there are fringe relationships or friendships for a season. I've taught it this way always, that there's three types of people in your life. People coming, people staying, people going. There you go. Welcome the people that are coming. Celebrate the people that are going. And listen, there's the keyword, to the people that are staying. Uh, who I want to take counsel from are the people that are that are rooted in my life, that plan to stay in my life, that are committed to my life. And uh, who I surround myself with is who I'm going to become like. And so... I know I've said it a couple of times, but at 40, I am more and more intentional about mm. who I'm spending my time with. Yep. I think for me that God's blessed us with rich relationships. There's the pun, but uh, <laughs> I don't wonder who I can go to dinner with on Friday night. It's more about who should I go to dinner with on Friday night? Who's going to be the Timothy? Who's going to be the Barnabas? Who's going to be the Paul? And maybe the other little hack that would be helpful for people is like, well, how do you get better people in your life? I think the way that you get better people in your life is not trying to be Paul. It's probably trying to be Barnabas or Timothy. There you go. Very the good. The silliest thing you can do to trying to get better people in your life is to try to Paul them. So Woo. good, man. Jeez. I see that a lot. So good. It's like, you're trying to Paul me? Like, exactly. cool. Well, I, I don't look at you as a Paul. So I wouldn't try to. So talking over, one-upping, trying to give counsel where no one's asked a question. I find when I'm trying to reach up, I take on a Barnabas. Let me encourage. I feel like I could always use another encourager in my life. Of course. I can find, I can always use someone who wants to affirm something in my yeah. life. Or I try to take on Timothy. I go in as a learner. I go in curious. Thank you. Hey, I got some of your time. Can, can I ask you these questions? Yep. Wow. How'd you do this? How'd you do that? Yep. It's amazing how far that will take you in life. And I think as we're talking about manhood and making friends Ooh, that's that might be the podcast title manhood right there manhood and making friends <laughs> making friends as a man <laughs> yeah like take take that avenue ask a question don't paul someone barnabas then timothy yeah. then i'm gonna preach a message on that that's fire Try, don't you trying to paul me you trying to paul me it's right a verb now. now i love that i got some pauls but i don't even know you bro yeah i think that that's just wisdom and self-awareness and i think that that's something that that you've taught me so much and that i've learned is uh sometimes we just want to articulate and look at like who are they how are they acting it's like man if we want to be a friend we first have to be aware of who we are yep. of what we bring to the table just scripture not not taking the the seat at the front of the table Go to the foot of the table. Be called up. Mm. I, I think that that's self-awareness to go, you know what, before I try to give value to somebody, I'm going to make sure that they even want it from me. I want to be an encourager first. And I think that that's where trust is established. Uh, um, it's so interesting. Uh, Harvard did a study on men and relationships. And this is what they said. They said oh, fostering gosh. strong social connections does not come easy for many men. But it is one of the best means to a longer and healthier life. Social connections wow. are as important to your health, wow. oh goodness, as proper diet and exercise. Research has linked social bonding to longer lives, lower incidence of depression and anxiety, and reduced risk of disease. I think it's, it's a phenomenal that there's so many benefits to friendship, but having uh, the right friends and for you in this season just talk about maturing last kind of question I, I wanted to ask is just does it feel different at 40 making a new friend what's different about that is it the same hmm. have you thought about that at all yeah 
I think that's a really great question. I think I think at 40, I, I've made a couple of new friends in the, over the last couple of years, and it does feel different. It feels maybe more mature. <laughs> <laughs> and all I mean by that is I feel like the people that I've been making friends with are like-minded, yeah. same values, and we don't get a lot of frequency or proximity. So quickly, what I see in the new friends that I've made in the last two years is that it's all about intensity and duration. Um, there's a couple in our church that I just love. It's actually a Harvard guy. And uh, I've just loved getting to hear his mind and the way that he thinks. And we probably get together maybe once a month. But they were just at our house a couple nights ago. That's another thing too, as couples, you know what I'm saying? Like couple friends. Yep. But we're in tears at dinner, you know what I mean? Like, and we're laughing hard. And it's not that everything's like this deep, like what you were saying, like shame. But like, right. man, we talked about all sorts of pain of our past. We also talked about ideas and concepts and talked about the dreams in our heart all over probably a three and a half hour, four hour meal. And man, you know, I don't need Harvard to tell it to me, but it's great when Harvard already, you know, qualifies what's in the Bible, that laughter's medicine for the soul. That's it. You know, that there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, that a brother's born for adversity, tough times. Like, so I think what's different to me, the friends that I've been forming the last two years, it just feels much more mature. It feels much more like we're both wondering what can we give to this relationship, not what can we take. Very good. I think the friends that I've made the last two years, no one's asking me for anything and I haven't asked them for anything. However, I believe quickly that each one of us are eager for the other person to ask and say, hey, you need my help. Let me know. And that feels mature to me. That feels healthy to me. Um, there's probably some other people the last couple of years too that I've allowed into my life that are in great need of me. And I have found great fulfillment in of being service to them. Yeah. And I know I keep coming back to this simple cliche, but I think I, as you're asking me the question, I see it. And it's like all three of those cylinders, you know, like transpiring that like I need some people that's like I can show up and at this point today help make part of their dream come true. Very good. That's a, that's a really cool place to be in that at 40 years of age, it's like, oh, I can be a part of one little puzzle piece of maybe helping you take the next step into what your journey is. So yeah, I think the big thing for me at, at making friends, it feels different. It feels different in the sense that it probably skips over a lot of the pleasantries. I feel like when I get together with some of these friends, it's like we understand how precious time is and there's a lot of unspoken truth. It's like, I get you. Here, here we go. Oh. <laughs> this is the best clothes ever. Here we go. C.S. Lewis. Yep. This is what C.S. Lewis said about friendship. Maybe I've said this year before. C.S. Lewis said a friend is born at that moment when you go, ah, oh, you too? I thought I was the only one. Beautiful. And what beautiful language. Beautiful. That's when you've stum stumbled upon a good friend. Yeah. When they just begin to speak and so much of it's unspoken. So much of it is like heart to heart connection. Some of my dearest friends right now I talk to maybe once a month, Yeah. but we get together. There is no snorkeling. It is deep scuba diving. And I walk away with my soul refreshed. Yeah. I walk away with treasure and it keeps me going. In fact, I would say it this way, even for what I'm doing with my life. And I'm sure there's somebody out there who's a business guy or some other kind of job or working somewhere. I would not still be doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for the friends in my life. People yeah. that have encouraged me kept me for the voices in my life and uh we need those voices especially us as men and i love having these conversations with you i think today's cool being on this balcony of design district yeah. and i think we need to do this more just kind of topic discussion things that we're reading because it really really even benefits me and i just think even walk away today it's like there's so much here that by no means do i think that we should just leave it here. i think we need to come back to this because right. this is not a one talk fix all. This is what are you learning and where are you growing? That's it. And hopefully leading in a way for those of you that are watching that like, man, you were not designed to live life alone. I hope that none of this conversation today shames you, makes yeah. you feel less than or condemns you. It's all meant to equip you and to empower you. And I always want to empower people not to be a victim. Like, oh, I wish I had friends like Richard, Dakota. I just want to keep like challenging you. Get a revelation today. Wow, this is not good for man to be alone. All right, so now what am I going to do to be a good friend? What am I going to do to start taking responsibility for the people's lives that they do give me pieces of their life? All right, am I responsible for that? Am I gossip? Am I trustworthy? Do I hold the truth? Do I speak life? 
do I look for moments to bring some depth to it? Am I, I, I was at, I was at an event not too long ago and I was speaking at it and they asked me to speak. It was at a big party. And this is what I said. I said, I don't think there's a, uh, I don't think there's such thing as a shallow party, which is sort of like a shocking statement. Of course there's shallow <laughs> parties. No, no, there's not shallow parties. There's shallow people. There it is. And so every party, every gathering, the question is, is there anybody there that's deep? Is there anybody who wants to bring depth to the moment? And depth to the moment is simply being real with my fears, with my insecurities, with my strengths, with my excitement, with my dreams. So be a person who brings depth to it. Bring purpose to the party. Bring depth to the friendship. You can do it. I know you can. And uh, you just start today. That's how maturity begins. It just starts right now today. We got a lot of things coming up in the life of uh, our community, in the life of our lives. The biggest thing coming up on our calendar is VUCON. Yep. 2024. And if you've lasted long enough here today in the podcast, I want to encourage you, get registered, get signed up. We have got so many friends coming from really all over the place to be with us June 20th through the 22nd, the 22nd at the Watsco Arena. That's at the University of Miami. And uh, go to vucon.com today. Conversations like this are happening all over the campus. And I think that's even a great place for you to meet some other uh, people that you could do life with. So uh, get registered. Get registered today for that. Also go to richwilkersonjr.com, get the leadership with Rich uh, email, and then always join us right here uh, on the podcast for more content we release every week. But we love you guys. Don't give up, don't quit. Dakota, thanks for being with me. Of course. You're a mature man. Love you. 30 years old. We love you guys.